All right, life-giving habits, that's our series. Um, Life, giving, and habits. Uh, In the weeks to come, I'm going to talk about habits. Today, I just want to talk about this life thing and the concept of what that is. Uh, We first got to understand that in the Christian life, God invites you to a brand new life in Him. What is that new life? It's two things, right? It's first eternal life, meaning after this life, there's a life with God that he invites us to. And the reality is not everybody gets there. We get there through the gift of Jesus purchasing our forgiveness on the cross, right? So eternal life, that's the first one, right? The second though is it's actually new life today. I would challenge you to read any book in the New Testament to see if it doesn't mention this new life. Let let me give you just a couple of these verses. Uh, They'll show up on the screen. They'll be in your notes. But if you have a Bible, I I want you to follow along with me today. And so open to Judges chapter 13. It's like way in in the Old Testament. Flip around there. You'll see the word Judges. If you don't have a Bible, there's one in front of you. All right. Okay. You might have a digital Bible on your phone. I'm going to read some verses from the New Testament that talk about this new life. Here's one. Romans 6, 4. We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a... All right, that was okay. It was not very impressive. You know, when the pastor like leans in and does this, that's when you get a little enthusiastic and finish the verse. But it's okay, we'll get there. I got two more verses for you. Do not let any part of your body become an instrument of evil to serve sin. Instead, give yourself completely to God, for you were dead in your old life, but now you have new life. There it is. So use your whole body as an instrument to do what is right for the glory of God. Well, one more for you. 2 Corinthians 5, 15 says, he died for everyone. Jesus died for everyone so that those who, that those who receive his will no longer live for themselves. Instead, they will live for Christ who died and was raised for them. I mean, it's this great news. I mean, the Bible calls it the gospel, the good news that Jesus died for us so that we could have this new life in the end, but also new life today. But I don't know if you caught it. Did you catch the responsibility that goes along with the privilege of, a good, of this new life? This responsibility is that we actually live not just with God, but we live for God. It's this calling, I'll call it. It's the calling of every believer. It's not just to walk with God, but it's to live for God. And that's what every Christian is invited to. But here's the problem, and this is the one thing we're gonna focus on this morning. We're gonna talk about it the entire time. The problem is this, is sometimes our character doesn't always match our calling. I mean, you're invited to this calling of walking with Jesus and living for him to honor him, glorify him. And, but there's moments, if we're all really honest, where our character doesn't match our calling. And I want to illustrate this with a story. It's from the Old Testament, Judges chapter 13, and you're going to recognize this name. It's the story of, of Samson. But I guarantee you probably only read part of his story. You don't know all of his story. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to do the speed reader's version of Samson's story this morning and give you a bird's eye view. His story is told in four chapters. We know more about Samson than all of the other judges. The judges were these leaders that God picked to lead the, the nation of Israel. We know more about Samson than all of the other judges. And so we're going to cover his life. Here it is real quick. Uh, Chapter 13, verse 3. In the very beginning of his life, there's a calling on Samson's life. It reads this way. The angel of the Lord appeared to her, meaning his mom-to-be, and said, you are barren and childless, but you're going to become pregnant and give birth to a son. Uh, Now see to it that you drink no wine or other fermented drink, and you do not eat anything unclean. You will become pregnant and have a son whose head is never to be touched by a razor because the boy is to be a Nazarite. We'll get to that in a minute. Dedicated to God from the womb. Now listen, this is what the text says right here. This is the calling on his life. He will lead, he will take the lead in delivering Israel from the hands of the Philistines. Your son, the one that is going to be born to you, he will take the lead in delivering Israel from the hands of the Philistines. 
Now this Nazarite vow, three parts to this, okay? The no wine, no alcoholic drink, right? No, uh, no haircuts. This kid's never gonna get a haircut. He's, he's, he's got dreads, man. That's what he's gonna look like. And don't touch dead things. That, those are actually the three vows that go along with Nazarite vows. And usually they're voluntary and it's made by someone who's saying, I'm, I wanna show God my commitment to him. No alcohol, no haircuts, and you never touch a dead thing because that would defile you. Um, that actually becomes very important later on in Samson's story. We will get there. Don't miss his calling. He's gonna take the lead in delivering Israel from the hands of the Philistines. The Philistines are these oppressive rulers over God's people, Israel, right? Samson, his calling is to be the national hero. He's gonna be God's man to set his people free. I mean, what an amazing high calling for your kid if you're the mom, right? Samson, as you know from rumor, mythology, like his story is this, he's an overwhelming man. He has this physique and strength that is amazing. He's more powerful than all the other leaders in the book of Judges, but don't miss this. He is more messed up than all of the other judges combined because of this one thing. Samson's character didn't match his calling. Let me walk you through his story. He becomes an adult, and Samson was first of all this, and you'll see this in your notes, you'll see it on the screen. It's, he's impulsive. Samson is driven by his eyes. He sees something and he wants it. Chapter 14, verse one, look it up. Samson went down to Timnah, that's an area of the Philistines, and he saw there a young Philistine woman. When he returned, he said to his father and mother, I've seen a Philistine woman in Timnah. Now go get her for me as a wife. He's not one to mince words. Saw her, liked her, dad, go get her. His mom and dad, though, are wiser than that because the Philistines are the enemy and you're going to marry into the enemy's family. But Samson doesn't care because he's disrespectful of his parents. Verse 3, his father and mother replied, isn't there an acceptable woman among your relatives and among all the other people? Must you go to the uncircumcised Philistines to get a wife? You have to go to our enemy? But Samson said to his father, get her for me. She's the right one for me. Samson? is a seven-year-old in a huge body. And I apologize to all the seven-year-olds that's offensive to you. I'm, Paul, I'm sorry. You get the point. Against his parents' wishes, there is a wedding that is set up. They go to Timnah, but on their way, it reads like this. Look at verse five. As they approached the vineyards of Timnah, suddenly a young lion came roaring towards him, Samson, who's by himself. It says, the spirit of the Lord came upon him so that he tore the lion apart with his bare hands as he might have torn a young goat. I don't know about you. I've never tried to tear a young goat. I could not do that, right? But a lion, he just rips it apart. He's a massive, strong man, empowered by God. Goes on. But he told neither his father nor his mother what he had done. Then he went down and talked with the woman and he liked her. Such a weird story. It actually sets up the next part of the story, and we'll get to this because we find out very quickly in his character, Samson disregarded God. This is where I get this from. Look at verse eight. Sometime later, he went back to marry her. He turned aside to look at the lion's carcass. He's like, oh yeah, this is where I killed that lion. I'm gonna go check it out. And in it, he saw a swarm of bees and some honey. He scooped out the honey with his hands and he ate as he went along. And when he rejoined his parents, he gave them some and they too ate it. But he did not tell them that he'd taken the honey from the lion's carcass. Now, if you know nothing about the Nazarite vows, you're like, that's just a, another weird story. But Samson understands what the Nazarite vow is. No alcoholic drink, no haircuts, and don't touch anything dead. But he sees the honey is like delicious reaches in, in a defiled moment, he's like, I don't care. I'm going to disregard the, the, the rules and the character that God wants me to have, and I'm going to do what I want. Not only that, but he gives it to his parents. If you remember, his mom had the same vow over her life, and he's defiling her without even telling her. The story goes on at the wedding. He decides to have some fun with 30 of the guards. Now, in the New International Version that you might be reading, that I often read from, it'll say um, companions. Now, think about this. Here's this big, massive Israelite man showing up to the enemy to marry one of the daughters. 
He has 30 guards in charge of him because it sounded like it might be his, like, the wedding party, right? No, these aren't his friends. These are men responsible for watching him. And so he decides to play a little game with them. Verse 12, hey, let me tell you a riddle, Samson said to them. If you can give me the answer within seven days of the feast, I will give you 30 linen garments and 30 sets of clothes. If you can't tell me the answer, you must give me 30 linens, uh, linen garments and 30 sets of clothes. They say, tell us the riddle. Let's hear it. He replied, out of the eater, something to eat. Out of the strong, something sweet. Now, if you know the whole story, like he's clearly saying that the, the eater is the lion and the sweet thing that comes out of it is the honey. But no one even knows. He didn't even tell his parents about this. So the 30 guards go to his bride and they blackmail her. Verse 15, on the fourth day, they said to Samson's wife, coax your husband into explaining the riddle for us. Check out the intensity of this. Or we will burn you and your father's household to death. These guys ain't messing around. So his bride, who by the way is nameless in this whole story, uh, the bride nags Samson mercilessly until he gives her the secret to the riddle. And in the final hour of the seventh day, these 30 men come to him and they give him the answer, the correct answer to this riddle, which simply reveals this about Samson's character. He's a sore loser. Samson says, okay, I'll pay you what I owe you, 30 linen garments. He runs 20 miles away to a Philistine town, kills 30 men, takes their gear, brings it back and says, here's your garments. He just killed their countrymen to pay off his debt to them. He is a sore loser. And at that point, he's so mad that he got taken advantage of. He's like, I'm taking my ball and going home. And he leaves. And he leaves his bride there with her dad. Samson's character, he's essentially an abandoner. He leaves her at her father's house and he just checks out. And then this happens next. Chapter 14, verse 20. And Samson's wife was given to one of his companions who had attended him at the feast. You leave your wife there like, okay, dad's gonna give her to someone else so dad doesn't have to take care of her for the rest of her life. I mean, this is a ton of drama in his story, but we are not even close to being done. Samson? He has no concepts, the concept of consequences. He left her, and now he's ready to come back, and instead of a box of chocolate in his arms, he's got a, he's got a goat for his wife. This is how it reads. Later on, I'm in chapter 15, verse 1. Look in your Bibles. Later on at the time of the wheat harvest, Samson took a young goat, and he went to visit his wife. It's the I'm sorry goat, okay? By the way, that doesn't work today, and it didn't work back then. Just a free gift for you there, husbands. He said, I'm going to my wife's room, but her father would not let him go in. And the father says, I was so sure. Let me get back there again. I was so sure that you hated her. He said that I gave her to your companion. Isn't her youngest sister more attractive? Take her instead. Look at this dad trying to solve the problem. Like, hey, listen, she's taken, but like, look at her younger sister. He's like, I can get rid of both my daughters. This, um, infuriates Samson. And you're about to be introduced even more to the violent nature of his character because he is vengeful. Here's the story. Samson captures 300 jackals. I think in your Bibles, it might say foxes. Um, Foxes are like solitary creatures. Jackals are more like coyotes. So they all band together. Listen, I, I don't know how he catches 300, okay? There's more miracles in this story than I can count. Catches 300, takes them two by two, ties them at the tail, ties torches to their tail and sets them off into the wheat fields that were ready for harvest. Samson is trying to destroy their economy and take revenge on them. So the Philistines... They turn around and go to his wife's house and they burn the house down with the father and his daughter inside. If that didn't infuriate him, he just rises up to this this ruthless violence. And it says in the text, 
he slaughtered many of them. Um, I don't know if you've been around people whose character doesn't match their calling. And their violence just perpetuates violence that perpetuates violence, perpetuates more violence. But in the midst of all this, you would think at some point he might come to his senses and say, what have I done? He doesn't, though, because here's what's next about his character. He's a blamer. He blames everybody else for his promises. Listen, he goes to this cave, and he hides out near this cave, and it's actually a cave near his own countrymen of Judah, and 3,000 guys from Judah. He's hiding in this secret cave, right? Well, 3,000 men show up from Judah to confront him. Apparently, it's not a great hiding spot when 3,000 other people know where it is. So these 3,000 men from Judah show up and they're like, what have you done? This is how the text reads. Don't you realize that the Philistines are rulers over us? What have you done to us? And Samson answered, oh, this is such a great quote. I merely did to them what they did to me. Doesn't that sound like something your seven-year-old would say? Like, they started it. He blames everyone else for the pain and the problems that surround him. And the men of Judah, they say this, listen, the only way to make peace is here. We have to offer you to them. So can we tie you up and, you know, we've got to give you over to them. He's like, sure, you tie me with whatever ropes you want. As they get close to the Philistines, he breaks free because that's what Samson does. He grabs the jawbone of a donkey and he kills a thousand men on the spot. That's what this story is about. But it's interesting. Do you notice what's absent from his story? It's like he just goes one thing after another and just reacts. Do you notice that there's not a moment in the story of Samson that he pauses and says, hey, God, what do you want me to do? Hey, God, help me. Hey, God, would you give me any kind of... He never cries out to God, except in this one moment right here. There's actually two places. I'll tell you both of them, but this is the first time. Chapter 15, verse 18. Look in your Bibles. After he's done killing a thousand men, it says, because he was very thirsty, he cried out to the Lord. Apparently, killing a thousand men with the jawbone of a donkey will make a man thirsty. You've given your servant this great victory. Must I now die of thirst and fall into the hands of these uncircumcised? Then God opened up the hollow place in Lehi, and water came out of it. And when Samson drank, his strength returned, and he revived. Sounds kind of noble, like, oh, God, help me. Can I just point out this? He's still driven by his appetite. It's like, God, now I have a need. Now I'm thirsty, and I just can't solve this. Everything else, God, I don't really need your help because look at who I am. He's driven by his appetite. This one, because of his thirst, and you'll see that there's another time he cries out to God because of his appetite, but it was too late, and we'll get there. Um. I just pointed this out, but what is absent from Samson's life is this, is he does not consult God. It's actually interesting because there are very few verses that you could point to to say, Samson had this amazing relationship with God. And that's what God invites his people to primarily. It's a relationship. And the chapter ends with this, 1520. Samson led Israel for 20 years in the days of the Philistines. And then it's weird because it jumps into a new chapter and he's still talking about Samson. And when I mentioned Samson, you probably initially thought Samson and yeah, Delilah, right? We haven't even gotten to her and his life is jacked up already. It's interesting. The, the next chapter starts uh, with this lustful account and it's just three random verses that are right there that talk about his exploits with a prostitute and then it gets into Delilah's story. So let me just say this, part of his character, he was unbelievably lustful. We'll get to Delilah's story right now. Verse four, sometime later, he fell in love with a woman in the valley of Sorek. Now you might not know what that means. It means it's another Philistine woman who was Delilah. The rulers of the Philistines went to her and said, see if you can lure him into showing you the secret of his great strength and how he, we can overpower him so we may tie him up and subdue him. Each one of us will give you 1,100 shekels. That is like millions of dollars. It's interesting that um, the weakness and the downfall and the problems in his life aren't new to him. It's another moment where you walk into this Philistine relationship 
And it's with this woman who is gonna, she's gonna raise trouble for you. And he doesn't need help in raising trouble, right? But here's, here's what he does. His character, he just loves to flirt with danger. And you know how the story goes, right? I mean, I'm sure you've all read this before. Delilah tries to follow through on what her countrymen want him to do. She, she nags at him, tell me the power of your strength. Tell me the power of your strength. And he lies to her three times. Well, if you do this, then I, I'll lose all my power. So she does that to him in the middle of the night, and then she'll tie him up, right? And then she'll say, Samson, the Philistines, they're upon you. And he gets up, and he's like, <laughs> breaks his chains or whatever he's got on him. Like, and she's like, oh, you lied to me. You kind of missed the point of the story. She just tied you up to give you over to the Philistines, but like they were hiding nearby, but they never come out. And he's like, oh, you're just playing games with me. Like he doesn't see the threat. He just flirts with danger. And then it reads like this. Finally, Delilah nags him to the point that he is sick to death of it. Men, do not say amen at this part of the scripture, okay? So he tells her everything. He says, I have this Nazarite vow, and if you cut my hair, my power's gone. He goes to sleep. Delilah calls the barber who shaves his head while he's asleep. Listen, I'm, I can be a heavy sleeper, but shaves his head while he's asleep? I, I don't get it. Delilah wakes him up. Samson, the Philistines are upon you. He woke up from his sleep. This is 1620, if you want to look in your Bibles. He awoke from his sleep and he thought, I will go out as before and shake myself free. But he did not know that the Lord had left him. It's one of the saddest verses in all of scripture. This man is born with this calling on his life to set God's people free. Samson is the most gifted and the most powerful of all the judges, but he's also the most reckless because he's enamored with his own abilities. I'm just assuming Samson had a lot of mirrors in his house and he'd walk by him, right? Guys, don't pretend like you don't know what I'm talking about, right? Come on. He's enamored with himself. Samson thinks he can defeat anyone, even if God doesn't show up to help him because he never really cries out to God for any kind of help in his life other than when he was thirsty. The Philistines, this is how the story ends. The Philistines capture him. They gouge out his eyes. They put him in a prison so that he can grind flour. Like, hey, listen, let's, let's put this muscular guy to work and do some work for us. At some point, the Philistines throw this huge party with thousands of people present. They trot out Samson. He's their trophy. They love, they're making fun of him. He has to perform for them. And afterwards, there's this young boy who's responsible for leading this blind giant. He tells the young boy, he says, would you let me rest? Put me near the pillars so I can lean up against them and rest. And the young boy shows him to where the pillars are that are holding up the building. And this is the only second time of his life that we know of that he cries out to God for his help. Here's the last prayer of his life, 1628. Sovereign Lord, remember me. Please, God, strengthen me just once more and let me with one blow get revenge on the Philistines for my two eyes. Doesn't it sound noble? God, you called me, my calling on my life is to fight the Philistines. And it sounds noble, like in one mighty blow, let me, let, let me take these pillars down and kill as many as I can. But do you hear what motivated him? Not to honor God. It's right there in the end. Let me with one blow get revenge on the Philistines for my two eyes. From the beginning of his life to the end of his life, he was driven by these. I saw it, I wanted it, and I was so immature that I did the very thing that I shouldn't have done because my character didn't match my calling. And at the end of his life, God, they took my eyes. I'm going to get revenge for this. Would you empower me to do it? He's a fool from the beginning to the end because his character didn't match his calling. Samson puts one hand on each pillar. 
And God gives him this miraculous strength, collapses the building, and it says that 3,000 Philistines died that day. And this is the final description of his life. Here it is. Thus, he killed many more when he died than while he lived. Could you imagine if that was the summary of your life? It essentially says this. You did more good in your death than when you lived. You did better things when you died than while you lived. I mean, quick question. Is that really God's intent for for Samson? I mean, was that the whole plan for Samson's life, for him to behave that way? I'm going to say this. I don't think so. Samson is a man without a filter, a man without a conscience, and a man without character who's driven by his appetites, but God used him anyways. But I would ask this question. What would his life have looked like if Samson's character would have matched his calling? Now, what's interesting about Samson in this story is that he's actually a reflection of Israel. I I don't know if you put those two together. So he's supposed to be this judge over Israel. Samson's whole disobedience and doing life without God is a symbol, it's a reminder that that's what Israel was. If you look at their whole story through the Old Testament, it says this again and again and again, that Israel forgot God and they lived like God didn't exist. They didn't cry out to him, they didn't care what he wanted of them and there were some big consequences and Samson faces these consequences. I spent, um, spent this whole morning just walking through this story and I wanna wrap this up because I just really wanted you to know this one thing. This new life that Jesus invites us to, part of it is so that our character can match our calling. Now, I will show this to you from the New Testament. It's just a short little verse here. It's from Ephesians 4.1. Paul writes this to the church, not to one individual, but the entire church. He says this, I urge you, to live a life worthy of the calling you've received. I urge you, every Christian, everyone who claims to walk with Jesus, everyone who who claims to have this relationship, if you're a Christian, then this is for you. The, the, The person, Paul, he says, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling that you've received. Here's our calling. It's to walk in relationship with Jesus. And as we do, to grow up to be more like him to be spiritually mature. Luke 6, 40, it's an interesting verse. It says this, the student is not above his teacher, but everyone who's fully trained will be like their teacher. Jesus said this, when you're fully trained, when you walk that closely with Jesus, here's what's gonna happen. Your character is gonna start looking a lot more like Jesus and a lot less like Samson. The theological term for this is called sanctification. Big word, don't have to go into it. It simply means this, that Christians are growing in their spiritual maturity. I'm going to show you a super juvenile um, diagram. It's in your notes. It's on the screen. I drew it myself. Clearly, I'm not an art major, all right? I won't even tell you how many hours that took me. This uh, diagram... This Christian journey that we are on is about this new life in Christ. He invites us to experience relationship with him. And I'm going to give more details in the weeks to come about what this new life looks like and what this character looks like, this walking with Jesus. And, but to experience that new life, our character has to match our, our calling. But here's what's odd about it. There's these obstacles that get in the way. There's this journey from left to right, right? But we hit this wall, and this wall is fear, anger, anxiety, and despair. For the last three years, I have wanted to preach a message about how God can conquer, and we can partner with God in conquering fear, anger, anxiety, and despair, because I've seen so much of that. Haven't you in the last three years? What happens in fear is that fear leads to habits. It actually, fear leads to bad choices and responses. And enough of that creates a pattern where now we have a habit. And it's a bad habit because of fear. We get this anxiety and it leads to a reaction and a response. And if we do that enough, it leads to a habit that leads to not this new life. It leads to bad life. You with me? 
Sometimes we just lose hope and there's despair and it makes us make these choices. Now, it's so easy to throw Samson under the bus. We take this big bird's eye view of his life and we're like, what an idiot. But you know why we can do that? It's because we see his whole life in four chapters and we did it in 15 minutes. But you and me, we don't look at our own life and go, oh my gosh, I am such an idiot. I should have seen this coming because we're in the story. We don't see where the path leads, where we're going. But all of our habits today, all of our responses to fear, anxiety, despair, anger, all of our responses are building patterns and they will lead to a destination. And I'm wondering if in this series, we can hit the pause button back up and look at all of our lives and just go, time out. Am I developing habits because of fear, anxiety, anger, and despair? Or am I developing habits that are walking me with Jesus into this new life that he has for me? That's what this series is about. By the way, you may have noticed that there's a dog in the picture to the left. And the dog represents a dog because life is just better with a dog. But one of those things that moves us from the the left to the right, two of those things is this. It is the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. Christ lives in you and with you, and he will lead you. But it is also those habits that we develop that help grow us up to the men and the women that God has called us to be so that our character can match our calling. And I'm just going to wrap up with this one question. We're going to walk through this whole series together for weeks to come, but I just want to ask you this. How does your character match God's calling on your life to walk with him, to become like him? Maybe the opposite question is this. Currently, how does your character not match the calling of walking with Jesus and to become more like him? Can we just reflect on that this week? Ask that question and be unafraid and unashamed to say, hey, here's the areas where I get it wrong. Because, man, if, you, if you're in your mind, you're like, man, I don't, I don't know. I am, I am pretty amazing. Okay, Samson, you go on your own power. And may God reveal to us this week how he wants us to journey so that our character matches the amazing calling he's put on our life. We'll pick that story up next week. Let's pray. God, thanks for those folks in this room. And I pray that somehow in the midst of this story, this disappointing story, that you would remind us that you're not done with us yet. Maybe fear has been a big deal for us. Maybe it's anxiety, despair, or anger. Lord, I know I'm going to be preaching to myself in these months to come because I struggle with some of these. And Lord, we want habits that are really going to grow us up. So God, this week, speak to us. Put a a finger on our hearts that maybe you're not done with us yet so our hope would rise. But also, Lord, show us and reveal to us how we need to grow so that we can walk in obedience to you. And I pray at the end of this series, God, there'll be so much life in this room because we're walking with you and you keep changing us. And if you want that, would you agree by just saying amen?